Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Satyas Kazimpour. Satyas wrote and published her first book under the pen name S.K. Way. And I should point out that she co-wrote the book with her friend, Kaylin Way, who could not make the interview today. The name of the book is The Deception, Island of Blood, number one. And the other interesting thing that I think you would want to know is Satyash and Kalen are going into 10th grade. Satyash, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel that you co-wrote, The Deception Island of Blood, number one, how would you describe the novel? Um, I would actually go with a review that was written a little, um, a little earlier. They describe it as a combination between The Hunger Games and Pretty Little Liars, which I kind of think well represents the book. Um, we try to incorporate a lot of things that went into a normal um, dystopian novel, but we added our own little twist. Um, there's a lot of challenges in this book, and it starts off with a committee um, that you know virtually nothing about, and it escalates into challenges that can potentially cause a lot of trouble for the ones competing in it. And I'm curious, what led you and Kaylin, your co-writer, to writing this novel together? Um, so the story behind this is actually kind of funny because um, this was just an inside joke between friends of the roles in this book. They're all based on real things said in real life. Um, of course, not the actions, but um, the roles they were based on things, how we acted sometimes, and the mother of the group, of our friend group versus the playful one. Um, it just kind of led from an inside joke into kind of inspiring a story between one of us from one story to another, and they just kind of connected into developing into this book. And had either of you written fiction or tried to write a novel before you sat down and collaborated on this? Um, the most we'd done before was our own little writing schoolwork writing on the side writing but nothing more um nothing such as a novel or a published work before this and i'm curious what kind of do you remember the the initial moment where you both decided like we should sit down and write this well i actually do we were sitting in our lunch period just in one of our school classrooms and we just decided that since we both really liked this idea, and at the time there was another writer with us, which is mentioned in the book at the end. However, um, due to a personal reason, she was forced to leave. But um, she was also a part of that. We just decided that since we have been talking about this idea a long time, because one of us brought it up a, a few months before, we just decided why not start it? Why not think about it more and see what we can do from there? And how did you decide to self-publish the novel after you had written it? Well, our most um, most of our decision was based on like how how well could we reach the audience we wanted. Um, we didn't want to traditionally publish right off the bat. We didn't know what we were doing properly back then. We did um, so. We put in some research. We decided that the best option for us, since we really wanted to keep our own independent side of it and wanted to do most things by herself, um, was to self-publish. However, all, um, both me and Kaylin hope to traditionally publish one day. But at the time, self-publishing was the best option for us after the research we put into it. And can you tell me about the writing process between you and Kaylin when you were working on it? Did you sit down and, and come up with an outline or a plot? And then did you work separately or were there ever times where you were sitting side by side or in the same room? What, what did that look like? Um, so we started off thinking that we would, able to, we would be able to write this all side by side, all together. Except the problem was as soon as the first chapter was finished, COVID hit. So we started off, we made a general outline. We decided to write whenever we were together. But as soon as COVID hit, lockdown started, we were forced to be in separate places. So of course we couldn't write together. Um, we decided to make up and make a different document, just kind of write uh, chapter by chapter outlines, what we kind of wanted while we were on a call together and have um, the chapters separated. We would have one person write one chapter as soon as they were done with that. Um, they would call the other person and be like, hey, I'm done with this chapter. Um, you can start your chapter here. And we just kind of go from there and just go back and forth. 
And I'm curious, did you use any other tools like Discord or anything like that while you were using? And I'm assuming you were using a Google Doc? Yes, we were using a Google Doc. No, we just kind of used our phones, contacted each other. (laughs) And yeah, no, we just went from there. And were you texting or talking to each other on the phone? Um, Just really depending on the day where the other person was. Sometimes you would call, sometimes you would text. Okay. And how did you find the self-publishing process once you decided to publish via the Kindle? Um, Well, the thing was, I was kind of looking into that and I searched up how to publish a book. And the first result that showed up was traditional publishing versus self-publishing. You know, I had never heard of self-publishing before. And I was really, really curious as to what that was. So I clicked on the link and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I started reading through the article and um, I started talking to Kaylin about self-publishing versus traditional publishing. And that's kind of how all the things started and we started looking into where we could publish and all of that. And I'm curious, are you two working on another novel now together? Uh, yes, we're actually working on the second book of The Deception. Um, which um, was supposed was supposed to kind of have a rough draft done this year, but however the problem was, we kind of gave up on that rough rough draft. We're starting all over again. We're hoping to have the second book published by around the same time next year. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer, especially for any younger writers who may be listening to this interview? Um, the main advice I'd give is. When you start off, you may not write like your own writing, but you, or you may love it, or you may not have enough confidence in yourself. The fact of the matter is, there's always going to be someone who can support you. There's always going to be someone who's going to enjoy the book to the fullest. Never give up on that writing. Tis the season for those irresistible ginger thins, cozy blankets for cuddling by the fire, and making home warm and welcoming. For one-stop holiday shopping, visit your local IKEA or ikea-usa.com slash holiday. From HBO's Insecure and executive producer Issa Rae comes a new satirical true crime podcast, We Stay Looking. After investigating the disappearance of a missing black woman in Looking for LaToya, Carrie J. Vaughn is back as Citizen Sleuth Rose Cranberry. Through comedy, We Stay Looking sheds light on the serious issues of systemic racism within the media and the criminal justice system. Produced by Radio and Tinderfoot TV with HBO, new episodes of We Stay Looking are available on all podcast platforms. And you can binge the entire season now on HBO Max. You can tweak it. You can edit it as much as you want. But don't give up on your writing because I assure you there's someone out there who's going to enjoy reading it. And it isn't just you. It is definitely not something to put to the side. Um, you're talented. You you can do this. It's it's wonderful. It's a wonderful experience. So, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Um, I mostly like biographies or autobiographies. If I do read nonfiction or just history books in general, the mi- mi- uh, most recent one that I have um, read was the I Am Malala book. Um, mm-hmm. that, that has impacted me in so many ways. I enjoyed that book so much. Um, but that was the most recent nonfiction book that I have read. And what about novels? Who, what are some of your favorite novels or something you've read recently that you really enjoyed? Um, I would say my favorite is Renegades by Marissa Meyer. That is my personal favorite. Um, I know Caitlin loves the Hunger Games. Um, but yeah, those are, those are our two favorites, Renegades by Marissa Meyer and Hunger Games. That's great. Well, I'm I'm curious, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about SK Way and your novel, The Deception? Yeah, so we actually have a website up and running with our novel on there, and um, you can find links to our book from there. Or if you just search up Deception by SK Way, um, you can find more information on Barnes & Nobles, Kobo, Amazon, and a few other libraries, um, such as Overdrive and Biblioteca. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Satayish Kazimpour. She co-wrote the novel The Deception, Island of Blood, number one, with her co-author, Kaylin Way. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Satayish, thanks for doing this interview today. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor to be here. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief reading from The Deception, Island of Blood, Book One, by S.K. Way. 
Island of Blood, Book Number One, The Deception, by S.K. Way. Iris. I awake with a jolt and find my arms and legs bound to a chair. I have a single memory, my first name, Iris. I don't know my last name, or if I even have one. I know one more thing, how to scream. I don't know why I scream, but I do. I scream as much as I can until it hurts. It feels like something is crawling, scratching, and breaking me from the inside. A few flickering torches give me a hint of my surroundings. Dark stone walls trap me, likely beneath the ground. But the floor looks man-made, glistening with a royal purple color. It looks like I'm in a horrific castle. Searing pain envelops my body as I struggle to break free. I gasp as the rope cuts deep into my raw skin, burning my flesh. I sigh and abandon my efforts. If I want to get out, my best bet is to wait for whomever locked me here in the first place. I stare at the blazing torches, thinking, if only they were close enough for me to grab one and burn these bonds. As the minutes pass, silence is my only companion. I close my eyes patiently, knowing that when they come, I'll be ready. I give in to the exhaustion slowly overwhelming my body, slouching in the uncomfortable chair. And I finally get some relief. I see black, only black. A part of me wants to stay in this inky darkness forever. There is no pain, no terror, no fear in this empty place. But I know I have to get out. I feel my eyes burning into the back of my head, just the urge to tense up and instead faint sleep. Once I feel the person's breath on my neck, I open my eyes, smirking. She jumps back, startled. She glares fiercely at me, furious at the trick. I bite my lip, slowly beginning to regret my mischievousness. Her stern expression tells me not to mess with her. As I continue to look over her curiously, I judge my odds of escape. They seem pretty low. Wavy black hair flows down the woman's back, blending into a blood-red color the further it goes down. On her wrist, there's a glowing bracelet which looks to be made of rubies and black obsidian. The woman's crown matches her bracelet, but has a golden outer rim. It looks to be made of large ruby shards, flawless save for the unusual gap on the right side. Her dress is gold with silver close-knitted patterns towards the bottom. The back of her dress trails behind her like a shining river of gold. It's the fanciest outfit I've ever seen. Now that I think about it, it's the only outfit that I've ever seen. The woman would be beautiful if it were not for her the obvious hatred in her empty eyes. Black holes of anger stared at me, but rather than cowering, my eyes met hers as I noticed a flicker of red on their empty canvas. She looks to be in her twenties, so the use of the cane she's leaning on piqued my interest. The cane is black with a golden trail of spikes that spiral down around it, along with a giant red gem on the handle. Her bitter voice snaps me out of my thoughts. Are you finished with all of your nonsense? I don't have all day and we have somewhere to be. I realize I've been staring at her for quite a few minutes. Her harsh tone scares me a little bit. What does she have against me? It must be something bad, considering that she locked me in a cellar for hours on end. I nod compliantly, once more judging my chances of escape. It's too early to tell, but I have a feeling that this lady probably has some dark intentions of her own. I just hope they don't concern me. Good. I'm going to untie you. You will get off this chair and put on the dress that I will give you. Then you will come and meet me in the hallway. Don't mess around or there will be major consequences. Do exactly as I tell you. Am I clear? I nod again. She gives me a smug, satisfied smile and taps her cane on the ground. My bindings instantly fall off. Before I can ask her about the dress, she leaves without a second glance, the door closing after her with a loud thud. Behind the chair is a little white cabinet. It's the only thing in the room. I'm shocked that I didn't notice it before. Something so bright should have stood out in this musty old place. I wonder, could it have appeared when my bindings came off? I walk over to inspect the cabinet, curious. I open one of the top compartments and find it empty. Dread starts to pool in my stomach. I move on to the other compartment. Nothing. I must have missed part of her instructions. I'm debating about whether to go tell the woman that there is no dress when my eyes fall on a tiny brown ball on top of the cabinet. This can't be it, could it? The ball is the size of a marble with a small crack in it. As I reach over to pick it up, my fingernail accidentally digs into the small crack. I feel a twinge of pain as my fingernail breaks in the crack, but quickly forget about it. The ball vanishes, shrinking, while the contents of its outer shell are turned to dust. I cough as the particles fly around in the air. Puffs of smoke finally clear up. A dress rests on the cabinet. Staples help small businesses print big. The print advisors at Staples sweat the details and quality of every project. That's what they call their print big promise. They're committed to getting your print job right every time. 
to treating your small business like a big deal and making it come to life, and to giving you expert guidance from start to finish. And now get 20% off signs, banners, and posters when you spend $75 or more at Staples. Offer ends January 1st. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Get two times the points when you buy any size hot or iced coffee drink with Speedy Rewards.